I really liked this new episode of Critical Role Campaign 3, and the first great thing that we need to talk about is the battle with the two clay golems to start the beginning of the episode. Firstly, I'm glad that they provided a real and tangible threat to the party. I could have easily seen if Matt would have rolled just a bit better that half the party might have gone down in that encounter but they really were saved due to Imogen's command spell. It really was a clutch spell from Laura Bailey, easily saving the party from a lot of damage that they really couldn't afford to be taking. Although definitely one of the most brutal moments was when Laudna moved out of the range of the two clay golems and got hit with two attacks of opportunity. In campaign 3 we've seen very few tactical slips from Marisha and this is the biggest one so far that I can remember. But it definitely did provide a good example to show just how much danger the party was in. These golems do not fuck around. And finally with this fight I want to talk about the incredible moment when the verdict the rival party used the immovable rod against Bell. Hells. As a DM, as a player, and as a viewer, I love when the enemies use the party's tactics against them. I think it provides a lot of realism to the world, and also, the party is multiple people against the DM's one. They just have more opportunities to come up with tactics. And Matt showed beautifully on how to use the party's own decision making and critical thinking against them. It was a fun little moment and the look of shock and horror on the players' faces was just incredible. But eventually the party get Windfolly, the earring that they are supposed to find, escape the clay golems and set a trap for the verdict. They wait until the verdict eventually wander into a fire-trapped room. And then, after sealing the doors, Bell's Hells turns on the oven three times. And Sam Regal kind of mentions how it's like the Milgram experiment. Now, if you don't know what the Milgram experiment is, I'm going to give you a short rundown. A Yale psychologist, Stanley Milgram, set up an experiment. This experiment centered around one volunteer asking another volunteer a series of questions, and whenever the other volunteer got the questions wrong, they would receive an electrical shock. Now, eventually the shocks rose to lethal levels, and the volunteer still kept shocking the individual. Now, the shocks were fake. The experiment was testing how an individual would respond to authority and if they would obey. The answer was generally yes, but there are many conflicting psychological studies revolving around the Milgram experiment. However, I think it is pretty close because Bell's Hells, while they were doing something extremely fucked up, also wanted to complete their goals. And so they would subject the rival party to three burnings. Who knows if they would have survived? But here's a rule for DMing in general. If the players can do something that will benefit them that is really fucked up, they're just going to do it. At some point, all morality falls away, and it just comes down to completing the mission. But it's what happened after the burning of the verdict that really made me fall in love with Bell's Hells even more. Because realizing that they did something terrible, they went and they helped the verdict. And that's why I love this party. They are genuinely not bad. They are good people. They are moral people. Even in the middle of conflict, they are still willing to help. To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if the Mighty Nine or Vox Machina would have taken the same actions. I think almost certainly they just would have left. Maybe they would have felt some guilt or regret, but I think Bell's Hells might be the only party that would have gone to help. I think it's these moments when we can really see who exactly the characters are. And you know what? If a book like Call of the Netherdeep is anything to go off of, I think we're going to be seeing the verdict in the future. These guys feel like a group that are going to be reoccurring throughout the entirety of Campaign 3. It might be another 30 to 40 sessions before we see him again, but I bet we'll see him again. I hope we see him again, and I want to see how the two groups progress. Now though, we should transition and begin talking about lore, specifically the lore of Hashari. This is a tidbit of lore that Matt dropped on the players as they were leaving the inside of the manor. He talks about how Hashari is a village or was a village in Isilra, and the leader uh, led this village via this elemental warship. Eventually the village turned up and was destroyed, and it's a cautionary tale against cults. He described it as a dark Hashari, and this got me thinking, as it always does. 
have we seen an adventure before in D&D 5th edition that revolves around this dark elemental warship? Yes. Yes, we do. The 5th edition adventure Princes of the Apocalypse centers around four corrupt prophets that have risen and found weapons connected to four elemental princes. They construct four elemental temples and begin to worship these elemental gods. But spoilers for Princes of the Apocalypse. Although I don't really think that you should worry about it because it's not a well-written adventure at all. Everyone was called together by the Elder Elemental Eye. And if you know anything about the Elder Elemental Eye, it is a guise for Therizdun. Look, at this point, it's just becoming blatant that the Chained Oblivion is going to be introduced in full capacity at some point in this campaign. There are too many connections not to believe it. So this is just another event to mark down and say, hmm, we'll probably be heading to the ruins of Hishari at some point and perhaps then we're going to get the true connection. But elemental warship, cults, destruction, that really feels like the Rizdun's MO. And I'm also interested to maybe learn more about the leader, the charismatic individual that was leading this cult. Perhaps we've already met them. However, eventually the party, after messing around with Yvonne Hydroga's things, stealing a book and some papers, leave and they go to collect their reward. They are immortalized in a magical picture, and then they head off. And then Chetney goes to a toy store. This toy maker is from Uthodurn, and when Chetney mentions the name Ulthgar, the toy maker immediately goes into an Uthodurnian standoff with Chetney. Now, eventually the two go their separate ways, but who is Ulthgar and why does everyone hate him so much? Well, if you've forgotten, Ulthgar was the individual who previously employed Chetney, but Chetney left Ulthgar due to a disagreement in quote-unquote business direction. Chetney then apparently fought Ulthgar and at least heavily wounded him. It's likely that this has something to do with Chetney's lycanthropy as well. But whoever Ulthgar is, he's definitely not good. And his influence is far and wide. And I would bet that Ulthgar's connection is going to somehow come from the furniture that is being moved around by the Treshies. I don't have any hard evidence for this theory, it just seems like the most natural way to introduce this obvious villain from Chetney's backstory. But moving on from Ulthgar now, let's discuss Estani and Orem's conversation. Orem and Estani talk, and Estani reveals the existence of a secret group. This group, known as the Grim Verity, is an underground collection of scholars and academics working together in more blasphemous topics. They are a unified force that works to uncover conspiracies. And we learn from Astani that the twins, before their deaths, recently became members of this underground organization. So they were definitely working to uncover some sort of conspiracy which put them in the way of Ira the Nightmare King, Armand Treshi, and the others. So, for answers about what the twins were actually doing, and perhaps more about Ruidus and Ruidus Born, they are going to have to make contact with the Grim Verity. In order to do that, Astani gives the name, one Ebenold Kai. Ebenold Kai is an old friend of Astani's and retired adventurer, and now professor at the seminary. So once again, it appears like all roads are leading to Yeos. Imogen has made it clear that she wants to head to Yeos, and really, what Laura Bailey wants in the party usually ends up happening, so it appears like very shortly, that Bell's Hells is taking an airship to Yeos. But now let's discuss the papers that were found in the house of Yvonne Hydroga. Some secret hidden papers that only revealed their contents under extreme cold were discovered by the party. One of these papers details Yvonne's uh, buyings of artifacts from around Alexandria. He did not travel. And one of the most regular sellers was uh, from the Spiraling organization, and one could assume Spiraling Shen. Now, Spiraling Shen appeared in Critical Role Campaign 1, episode 42 I have here in my notes. And Spiraling Shen is a part of the CLASP, a far-reaching criminal organization. I would personally doubt that he would be used in any capacity in this campaign. I think that this is probably 
um, just a, a callback to campaign one. But if the gang ever does go artifact hunting, Spiraling Shen might be the contact point. Another paper though is more interesting because they deal with crate shipments to Gianna Hexum. Three crates in particular connected to the nobodies coming from Wildmount. What makes it more interesting though is that the crates are then quickly sent off from Gianna Hexum. She is just a waypoint. Which means that Gianna Hexum is working with another person who has these crates. It is certainly concerning and I would like it at some point if Bell's Hells tries to question her to see what the hell is going on. But Gianna Hexum is a dangerous woman and trying to get embroiled in her business well, it almost cost Ashton his life. And also, whatever he found in one of those crates definitely messed with his mind. And I'd like to put forward that perhaps these shipments are of Gnarl Rock, the Feywild Rock that corrupts everything around it. They have to move the Gnarl Rock in shipments because too much of it could corrupt the general area. Or perhaps Gianna Hexum is moving more golems or constructs, at least the materials to make them. Whatever the case, Gianna Hexum is becoming a bigger and bigger part in Campaign 3, and definitely a person that will probably be an antagonistic force in the future if if the party does not play their cards right. And finally, as the party is returning back home to Drusar, they level up to level 6, and now we are waiting to see what's happened in Drusar since they left. Has the corruption below the spires spread anymore? What have the green seekers done? All these questions hang over our heads, but all we can do is wait now. If you need more content before the next episode of Critical Role, check out this video right here, and thank you for entering the dungeon.